I don't think it's fair to call us either a Treyarch or an Infinity Ward style, but certainly the, the best learnings from both studios have given us a great foundation to deliver on Call of Duty. You know, when I pick up a you know, third or fourth version of a, of a game, I want it to feel like a little, you know, okay, I'm familiar with it, but would you bring me new? And we've gone through the entire game. I mean, even, even to the HUD, the front end, how we're gonna do the movies, Everything like that, we are trying to innovate and change. But at the same time, you know, maybe we change it up as much as possible, but there's something in it that people can say, ah, it's still Call of Duty. Because right? we know there's millions of people that play it, and they don't want a completely different game. They want Call of Duty, but better, different, innovative. And I think that's what excites us about Advanced Warfare, right? innovation through this concept of the XO, off the controller changes. And so for us, I think that, that was the message that I most... Um, took to heart coming out of MW3, which was with all the effort and energy and push, we needed to bring a new way to play Call of Duty. And you're going to see that, right? We've brought verticality and strength and exo, exo abilities yeah. in ways that this is Call of Duty from the spirit of everything you've loved about it, but it is a different Call of Duty, and we think that's going to be pretty fun for the fans. We talk about the big moments. We talk about pacing an awful lot. To me, this is the this is the summer blockbuster. This is the big guy, right? And people are waiting for it. We want them to go, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that in a game. Right. We've kind of joked about what's the next thing we can do. We just took down the Golden Gate Bridge on an aircraft carrier. And we're like, well, we could blow up the moon. <laughs> and because, uh, you know, where do you go? Um, so we're looking for the we're looking for those big moments that are. Uh, we're not blowing up the moon, just for the record. <laughs> I was thinking blowing up the moon would be great because think of the tides and all the changes that would happen. So yeah, I mean it's not it's not just about the big moments right now. It's about those emotional moments, and they can still be big and bold. But it's to me right now, this point in our career, and I think in video games with the the new consoles. And the amount of fidelity you can get with the characters, it's about emotional uh, connections. Narrative is, is extremely important to us. Not that it isn't to the others, but uh, we, we pay an awful lot of attention to that. It's, it's just something that, uh, as a gamer, that I want, I want to have when I'm playing a game. And um, I just feel that video games is the next medium to be talking about a story. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to be doing, tell, telling a story. You guys have been in the industry for so long. Don't you feel like you've been saying that for... 20 years now? Yes, and you know, the thing is we have been trying as developers to do that, but a lot of times, I mean, you, you think about it maybe five, six, seven years ago, a lot of us were making licensed products. There was a big deal in licensed products, and, and it's hard to tell any other story in there. So there's about four or five years in there, where that's what we're making. You kind of kind of lose that muscle memory to make your own story. And so when you finally can, you kind of you branch out and... Uh, I think that's what's what's taking place in the industry right now. A lot more people are going, yeah, from freedom, I can t tell a story. So it's been one of the core focuses of this game. Yes. Right, is the opportunity to, to focus on a rich narrative through a single protagonist. One character was pretty important because I, I felt there was times where I'd have to get used to another character and, and what is their story arc. And not that that was bad. It was, I thought, the first time I played that, that was really cool. But in, in this case, we're like, it's, it's about the narrative and it's about this guy's journey, right? It's not just a military story. I mean, this is, this is about family and camaraderie and pain and loss. And so we were needed to tell those. And I think the best way was through that one character, which is a, a change for uh, Call of Duty as well. Can you describe who Mitchell is? I don't think we've really touched on that yet. You know, he's a, he's a, uh, a dude from uh, the United States, um, just sort of a, a normal guy, right? He just joined the military. Um, we do have a whole big backstory on him, and I mean, it's it's fairly generic in terms of, and that's what that's what we wanted. We wanted a guy who started off as anybody. You know, he has friends that are maybe taken away from him, things like that. But he starts out as a normal guy, and we see him grow over the course of six, eight years. Are you guys also going to pack a lot of the story and kind of context for what's happening in the loading sequences with like the motion graphics? Are you taking that same approach? We're taking a. Uh, quite a few approaches and you know part of that is is with the movies and we're going to be doing something a little special with the movies in between the cinematics. We found a really great opportunity to move the narrative forward. We call the model sort of a just-in-time information approach. In past Call of Duties generally the load movies were about beautiful graphics and voiceovers that set up a tremendous amount of both story and objectives. Trying to cram all that information into a very short amount of time, 30 seconds, left the player little time to actually get emotionally attached to it and digest it. So we've 
changed the paradigm. And we've used the, the load movies to really deliver on the emotional engagement. Uh, we're going to deliver the story and the narrative impactfully through the load movies and use just-in-time information through things like um, real-time in-game HUD elements so that the objectives come when you need them, right? And the story sinks in through these really beautiful and engaging um, cinematic moments. I like your business use of just-in-time. You like that? Not really, but uh, I want them more to be the motion graphics than motion, motion graphics. We want to show the emotion is in there as well. We want to show the character. And in this case, we will, Mitchell will talk. So he's, he's not necessarily talking in game, but he's talking in the movies. He's actually narrating the game. And so we'll, we'll have it from um, the perspective of, of him kind of watching over the game. And so you are going to hear his voice, but not in, in game. It's, it's interesting. And then the cinematics, again, we're spending a lot of time on that because we've got the, uh, uh, the facial animation stuff. It's spending so much time on, on that. And in all fairness, I think Ghosts, their cinematics were some of the most technically beautiful good, cinematics yeah. I've ever mm -hmm, seen mm -hmm. in any game, right? They were beautiful, but there was so much information laid across the top of it that the narrative didn't have time to sink in. At least that was my experience. And so by being able to deliver the mission objectives and more of the real-time status updates through the level, it's really given us a great opportunity to use those moments to really drive the narrative. Isn't it kind of weird that Mitchell will talk in the loading screens but not in the game? Don't you think it's going to be kind of jarring for players? At first, you know, we've, we've talked an awful lot about it, right? And, and it just feels like that once we're in game, uh, I want, want you to feel like you're Mitchell. And if all of a sudden I've got this other voice coming out, um, it's not, you know, I don't know, it doesn't feel like, like me. You know, in Dead Space, we took it completely away from you. And then there were times that it felt like the character was, uh, it was just being, hey, don't forget to go left, go right. He had no voice. So in this case, we're going to give him a voice, and it's a pretty strong voice, but in the game, we want it to be your voice. You know, you know the difference that I found uh, that I think is happening with this generation of games? Before, we were always searching for ways to immerse you in the game, right? Because the graphics weren't always that great, and, and um, we're trying to make you get in the game. Nowadays, I believe that you are immersed in the game, and I don't want anything to take you out, like a glitch in the animation or a bad texture or possibly your character talking. Like, I, I believe that we have you immersed. It's our job to keep you there, and that's one of the things I think will pull you out. You think the word follow on the screen takes players out of a game? You may not see that. Is there no follow in this game? We're working on ways to make that feel uh, like it's part of your HUD. In 50 years, I mean, the GPS systems are going to be amazing. It doesn't have to be a follow dot, is what I'm saying. It will feel much more immersive. Yeah, I mean, our goal was to not take the control away from the player ever. You know, as Glenn spoke to this concept of never wanting to break the immersion of that story mode experience. So it's important for us that as much as possible, as a player, you're in control. And that includes the ability to look around and engage in, at all times. Yeah, don't put the burden on, we'll never do it. But no, <laughs> I said that was the goal. Yeah, yeah. If you break your goal, it's on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the, the truth is, there's been here, uh, here and there have been places where we have done that sort of in our prototypes right now, in which we're going back and we're going, come on. Let's go. Let's not fall in love with our animations. We're going we're gonna to make sure that the player is doing most of that. Uh, as Michael said, that is a goal, and we keep going through and finding new ways to give the uh, control back. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty interesting, I mean, the things you have to do to do that. If I feel like well, nothing's going to happen to me, let's see what the game decides to do, then I, I'm not sure there's an emotional connection. I mean, obviously, we can talk about the production values we want people to remember. But I think for the experience, we want people to say, hey, this is the most innovative gameplay I've played in Call of Duty. And it's a rich narrative. Like this story and these characters mattered to me. Bridge too far, but I would say our goals as, as entertainers is to deliver like a red wedding scene through interactive entertainment, right? And have people talk about Call of Duty on that sort of level one day. Oh, wow, very deep. Okay. I, I want, you know what, I, uh, I want people to go, crap, it's over. You know, I, I, <laughs> I mean, well, you said the deep part. I'm going to say the Jersey part. I mean, we're giving them the opportunity with, with some of the uh, um, XL abilities in the, to play the game over again. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, I want them to walk away and just say, I, wow, I finally, 
there was a great story in a, in a video game. Like it can be done, right? And, um, and and that's a big deal. And then I want them to go on and play multiplayer. I mean, it it really is about the fans, and it really is just trying to get as many people uh, uh, playing it as possible. And um, if they go back and they just go to their friends, you got to play the new Call of Duty. Um, they listen to us. Then then we won. I think that's well said. Wow. You don't hear that very often from me. <laughs> Not at all. First time.